I want you to repeat something after me. Say teaching, teaching. And, nurturing and nurturing are not the same thing. Not the same. Say that again because I want to make sure you get it. Say teaching, teaching. And, nurturing and nurturing are not the same thing. There's an epidemic in our country today, been going on for quite some time, a lot of other countries experience this as well, is that there's many teachers, many people that want to pass on information, but do not do, do, not do the things that causes the next generation, those that follow us, to be well-equipped with their leg of the race. Uh, nurturing is what's necessary. Oh, I'm raising boys. I'm raising tough boys. My, I don't need to nurture my boys. Uh, well, let me just tell you, knock that off. I'm not talking about babying. I'm not talking about coddling. That's what happened to Samson. I don't know if you know that. Samson was a man's man. But the angel showed up and said, you know, your, your boy's special. And, and uh, he's going to be a Nazarite from birth. Do not cut his hair. Do not give him any strong drink. You better raise him because he is a Nazarite from birth. And so they, uh, when he was born, the first, all they knew is he's special. He's special. He's spe Everybody say he's special. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, don't coddle your kids. Nurture your kids. Train your kids. Develop your kids. Correct your kids. Instruct and teach your kids. But a nurturing, an undergirding, a protecting, a pouring has to occur if the generation after us is going to run the way God wants them to run. A long time ago, a very wise old apostle, prophet, as soon as I became pastor, I encountered this uh, conversation it brought me an amazing truth that it still holds true today. And also the same truth was reiterated uh, 10 years later by John Paul Jackson. The same exact thing. Um, he said that the Achilles heel of the church and ministry today is that there is a lack of and poor planning of succession. Uh, let me explain that to you. What, I'm, what I mean is after you run... Your leg of this race? Grab this question. What's going to happen to what you did for the Lord once you're out of the race? Thank God some of you guys and many other pastors, leaders, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, do an amazing thing. Some of you guys have been involved in the community. You were trailblazers in your business, trailblazers of social activity and, and, and things that drew people closer to God. Thank God for that. Can we give God praise that some of us got did something right? Amen. Amen. But what's going to happen after we're not in the race anymore and someone comes behind us and runs with the baton passed to them? Are they going to be equipped to run their leg of the race well? Or does it die with you? Oh, God doesn't want it to die with us. God wants... That's the, that's the heartbeat of Jesus. Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, these things shall you do, and greater things shall you do than these, because I go to the Father. He was talking to his disciples, and, and the things they were talking about was raising the dead, casting out demons, healing the sick, opened up blinded eyes, bringing hope to the hopeless. He said, you're gonna, hey, you're going to do all this, and you're going to do even greater things than these. And I believe what the... Lord is just saying to us today is that we want those that run after us, that come after us, to run faster, to jump higher, to be more anointed, to be more in tune with the Spirit of God. It's not just about coming to church and putting on a facade. No, 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 no. That we would be the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus. How about this? The heart of Jesus, the smile of Jesus, the kindness of Jesus. It's not about how much Bible you know. It's how much do you look like Jesus. 
Where, is, where are his hands and feet in the earth today? You know, this, the best analogy that, that I can think of that describes this whole passing the baton, I actually said it, uh, is, is a relay race. Now listen, when I say relay race, I'm not talking about elementary school relay races. Some of you guys can really understand that. There's half of the students are on this side, half the students, and they run back and forth like that. No, I'm talking about junior high, high school, collegiate, and Olympic track, like the 4 by 100 have you seen those races? The four by 100, they have like eight lanes on the track, four people on the team, the gun goes off, and the lead guy takes off with the baton in his hand. He's going around the track, and then it comes around, the person in position two hands the baton, he grabs the baton, he does second, and the third, and then the anchor comes around, and he grabs it, and he runs, and he wins the race. And here's, the, here's how you win the race. You don't get disqualified. You can do everything right that you, it looks right, but if you break the rules, you get disqualified. There's a lot of really fast times that don't count because they got disqualified. So what are the rules? Here's the rules in a relay race that, that, that track relay races. Number one in the relay race is you have to stay in your lane. Oh, there's some people running a race very similar to yours, but it is not your race. You can't. Hey, stay in your lane, bro. Do not get in somebody else's lane. There's a lot of jealousy and pettiness regarding church and ministry. Oh, they're doing this, and we're, or y'all are doing this, and they're doing that. And oh, oh, great. Pray for them. This is one thing I want you to do, River of Praise. When you drive past another church, I don't need you to look at them in any kind of criticism. You need to drive by with your hand out the window, and, and, and you need to say, Bless them, Jesus. Bless them, Jesus. Increase them, Jesus. Help them, Jesus. You know, how many of y'all do this? You don't have to admit it. If you want to, it'd be awesome. But how many of when you drive by a graveyard, you hold your breath? So, that's right. So, who else does that? Does anybody else do that? Some of y'all do that. You hold your breath, right? Or you close your eyes or something, something like that. It's a, that's superstition. I don't believe in superstition, I be, but I do believe in creating a culture, something that reminds you, that triggers you. You know, that, that, that word trigger is around today, right? This needs to trigger you. I want this to trigger you, that when you drive past a church, your hand automatically goes up like this, and then you say, bless them. Oh, bless them. Bless them, Jesus. Well, what if they're messing things up? Well, if you ask God to bless them, bless them means sometimes he brings correction. He brings revelation. Sometimes there's just a move of the Spirit of God and, and fixes them. I hope people pray for us. Because we don't always do everything right. Oh, well, almost. I mean, almost. No, no, no. You're better. You're the best. You're the best. Hey, remember that? You're the best. We need to have that attitude. So, so in the relays, and so, so you stay in your lane. Here it is. You know what else you do? You, you exchange inside of the exchange zone. There is a, there's a start to the exchange zone, and there's an end to the exchange zone. You cannot grab the snatch, the baton, before the exchange zone, or you get disqualified. Meaning, there's a lot of people that want to grab and snatch the baton before it's their time, and that messes things up. You want a better analogy? If you ever see a caterpillar trying to crawl out of its cocoon to be a butterfly, you know, if you help that butterfly, he will die. Because there's something that happens in that developmental process that strengthens the skeletal structure to cause it to be able to fly. If you help it, they never get the strength they needed from that particular struggle. Somebody didn't get that today. Another thing that will cause you to be disqualified is you drop the baton. Listen, what we need to do is make sure that we don't drop the baton. That when, when we're running that, if we're in the lead leg or second or third leg, when we pass that baton, we need to make sure that we're running right, we're running in step. And when, and when we pass that baton, that we are sure to place it in their hands to where they can get it. Don't just toss it to them. Set them up. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not just talking about ministry, right? I'm not talking about the pastorate. Listen, I'm talking, listen, I'm, I need to make sure y'all know this. I ain't going nowhere. I'm here. Yay. Thank you, Sonny. I'm not going anywhere. My seat on the bus may change. In fact, I may have several buses, but I'm not going anywhere. I might not even have a bus. I might be the one that changes the tires on the bus. 
All I know is this is, this is what God said. This is where I've called you, and this is where you will stay. And so until I breathe my last breath, I'm going to be intricately involved in River of Praise. Amen. Yeah. That's my deal. That's my deal. But I want to talk about you. I want to talk about you. Here's what you need to understand. What you do matters. And how you train and equip and nurture those that follow you is a big deal. Whether it's your children, whether it's your students, whether it's the people in your business, whether it's the, 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 the young men or women on your sports team, if you're a coach, listen, what you do matters. It's not just about putting points on the scoreboard. It's about training up young men and women to be men and women of character. What you do matters. I just want you to know, in a relay race, if you don't do everything right, it'll cost you. And it may even disqualify you. Getting out of the relay race and getting into life and getting into ministry, if you don't run your relay race right, it may not only cost you, just hear this, it may cost you more than you ever realized that it would. The lack of nurturing will cost you big time. And I just want to say this. There may be some of us in the room right now that we feel like, man, nobody nurtured me. Nobody poured into me. That, that says something. But what says more is that God knows right where you are, right here, right now. And it's up to you whether somebody pours right or not. Where are you going to be? Because God knows where you are. And he knows how to find you and he knows how to equip you. And sometimes what a leader teaches you is not what you should do, but what you shouldn't do. Right? That's right. Now watch this. There is a, this whole baton, this relay race thing. There's an analogy in the word of God that I want to bring you to. It's the relationship between Elijah and Elisha. And this whole nurturing thing that, didn't exist. And before I even get into the story, I just want you to know this. So I've talked about the relationship with Elijah and Elisha before. I'm writing that book called The Mantle, which is about this very thing we're talking about today. And it seems as though as I don't like Elijah. I love Elijah. In fact, we know without, regardless of his flaws, what he did, good or bad or indifferent, know this. He still ended his life in a very special place, meaning he got the, uh, the flaming Uber ride into heaven. The chariots came down. That Listen, that Bentley come down on fire out of heaven, swooped down, picked him up, opened up. Yes, come on, come on in here. And they just flew off to heaven. You can't tell me he messed everything up coming in like that, going out like that. Also, you find in uh, Jesus with Peter, James, and John went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus said, guys, I have to really, nobody else gets to see this. In fact, I don't want you to even tell anybody about this, although they told people, right? Don't tell nobody. He took, takes them up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's Jesus. I want to show you something. And right then, two other people just the veil was pulled back. The spirit veil was pulled back. And there's two people standing right next to Jesus. Moses and Elijah, both of them. And then that's the second time you ever hear, it's in the book of John, the second time you ever hear the voice of the Father say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So, so we know there's a lot to that story, but I just want to say this. Elijah may have not done everything exactly right, but know this, know this. He didn't mess it all up because he got the limo ride to heaven, flaming limo ride, and on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he did not do everything. Can we just give God praise for Elijah? Right. Amen. Okay. But I want to talk about this relationship that had indifference all through it and lack of nurturing all through it. Check this out. Elisha is the prophetic apprentice of, and servant to Elijah. Both of these major prophetic voices made a significant impact on God's people. They were the voice of, of the, the moral voice, the spiritual voice to them to try to get them to turn things around. Elijah and Elisha, both of them had similar ministry flows. Some differences, 
Similar miracles. They both raise the dead. They both, using the mantle, touches the Jordan River and it parts and they walk across on dry ground. I mean, they both did that miracle. Changing the elements, supernatural provision. These guys were amazing. So in one sense, we look at Elijah and we say, man, he couldn't have done everything wrong. Because, because man, these same similar miracles Elisha does later. So we presume that he did everything right. Yeah, well, let's go back to the story a little bit. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. It's a story when there was a king named Ahab, and the children of Israel were under bondage, under this leadership, and there was this, there was this wavering of the people. They were had, in one sense, at, at times their hearts were just... Uh, drawn towards the Lord God of Israel. And then at other times, they would go straight up into Baal, B-A-A-L, worship. And the other God was Ashereth. And, and so I want to, because here's the G-rated version. The God of Baal and Ashereth was, was, was a very pornographic in nature. And they would, and it's something how the same things they struggle with now, mankind struggles with today. There was this struggle between serving God and serving the appetites of the flesh. And so the people were wavering all the time, all the time. And there was a stirring inside of Elijah the prophet to deal with this. But before he confronts it, three years before that, King Ahab and Elijah get in this confrontation. They're arguing with each other. And finally, Elijah had enough of it. And he said, you know what? We're not even doing this anymore. Here's the deal. It is not even going to rain one drop until I say so. Three years later, it hadn't rained a drop. Not one little bit. So there's this season of intensity that the children of Israel in. You would think with a season of intensity. Have you heard the saying, there's no atheist in, in foxholes? Right, you would think, right, that these people would be turning to God. They're not turning to God. They keep serving God one minute. The next day, they're all wrapped up in their immoral idols. And finally, that stirring got to Elijah. And he has a gathering of people. Ahab is there. And there's the 450 prophets of Baal. And it doesn't talk much about it, but 400 other prophets of Asherah, which is the female version of, of Baal. And Elijah says, how long are we going to waver between these two opinions? How long are we going to deal with all this nonsense? He says, I have an idea. We're going to have somewhat of a contest or a display today. I will have a sacrifice to the Lord God, Jehovah, to, to the God of Israel here. And over here on this other side of this gathering, the 450 prophets of Baal will have their own sacrifice. And I will call out to Lord God Jehovah and ask him to consume the sacrifice. And the 450 prophets will call down upon, call Baal to consume their sacrifice. And whichever sacrifice is consumed, we're going to know that is the real God. And the other one, obviously not, is the penalty back then for false prophets was death. And the prophets of Baal said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And all the people were like, can, can we just put it in this, this day and age so we can really relate to it? There's all these people. They don't have social media. They don't have something else to run to. They don't have anything for entertainment. Man, they go and they get the popcorn. They're sitting there on their little, on their little, on their little log. And Man, all right. Hey, this is the entertainment for today. Let's see how this goes. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's watch this. Okay. Prophets of Baal, you first. If you, if you don't know this about Elijah, he was funny. He had a person, he had a personality. And so these prophets are running around, oh God of Baal, 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 consume this sacrifice. And so they wore out, wore that out for several hours. Go consume the sacrifice. Come on. Consume, consume, consume this. It didn't matter what they did, nothing was happening. We get about halfway through the day and dust is everywhere and they're they're wore out. They're sweated up and everybody just kind of I don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden here comes Elijah. He says, Hmm. Hey, well, 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 maybe. 
uh, Baal went on vacation. Maybe he's taking a nap. <laughs> Maybe he's just irritated. He just started just saying stuff, just just jacking with him. What what's going on? I mean, did he even take a taste of it? You know, and everybody's like, "Oh snap!" He he just he just said that, and they finally got so upset they started read it. They started cutting themselves. They started I mean, self mutilating I mean, they were like they knew that if something didn't happen, they were going to get executed as being a false prophet. Everybody, Elijah said, hey, time out. My turn. <laughs> he said, today, folks, you're about to see who the one true living God is. But before I make my appeal to my God, I need you guys to do something. Uh, go ahead. There's, so there's a trench. There's a, a barrier around the sacrifice. There's the wood under the sacrifice, stone and wood under the sacrifice. The sacrifice is laid on top. And he said, okay, so just soak this thing, just water. Just soak it. Make it completely wet. And he said, no, no, hey, do, do it again. I really want to make sure it's completely soaked. It's waterlogged. There's no way this can catch on fire. Okay, do it one more time. Just soak it, soak it down. I mean, I get this mental picture that this sacrifice is so wet, he's walking in the mud. I mean, there's water and mud and slop everywhere. I mean, water's pouring over the top. He says, Lord God, reveal to your kids today that you are the one true living God. Fire came down out of heaven. Boom! <laughs> ah, dusty. <laughs> Get this like that. I mean, it's like he's struggling with lightning. Boom! It's gone. Goes and grabs the 450 prophets of Baal, executes them on the spot. Everybody leaves. You talk about an awakening that happens to God's people. What would you do if all of a sudden we're hanging out here and, and, and God just, boom, hit the place with the lightning? Man, I, just, I, don't know, I don't know where you're running off to, but I'm saying, God, help me. God, help me. There was an awakening. There was an unforgettable moment that happens. Everybody leaves. Only people there left is Ahab and Elijah. He says, you know, we had a conversation about three years ago that it wasn't going to rain until I said, he said, uh, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Yeah. Hey, uh, and he tells the servant, go tell me what you see. And he says, I see a, a cloud about the size of a man's hand. He goes, yeah, Ahab, you better get in your chariot. You, you better get on your Harley. You better get, you better, you better get on out of here. You're going to get stuck. And he gets the horse chariot is driving off. And tell me God isn't just, isn't funny. This, this old prophet standing there in his, in his, in his flip flops and in his gown or, or, or robe or whatever it is. And the word says he outruns the chariot all the way back to town. He just, he just, <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? What, but, but I look at the story and I go, it would have been so much better for him had he not outran the chariot. Because he gets there before Ahab does. He's kind of hanging out, just seeing what Ahab's going to do with this new, newly found uh, revelation that God really is who he says he is. He goes up to Jezebel, his wicked wife. I'm not just calling her that. She really was. You're not going to believe the kind of day I had at work. I mean, this, this is some kind of day. And Elijah, being who Elijah is, you know, we've been fighting for three years now. And, and uh, he says it's going to rain today. We'll see. But, man, this, oh, your 450 prophets that you love so much, oh, he killed them all. That mean old lady, she got fired up. She said, and Elijah was close enough to hear and see the look on her face. Because it says, when she said what she said, it, 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 it wreaked terror inside of his heart. And he takes off running. I mean, he's really freaked out. May the same thing. I'm going to talk like Jezebel for a second. May the same thing. That happened to those 450 prophets. Happened to him by this time tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> he 
He said, snap! He takes off. He takes off running. He runs. And the Bible says he's running. He's running. He's like, he didn't get his shoes or nothing, Jesus. I mean, he running. He's running. He's running. He's running. 40 days he's running. Listen, Forrest Gump ran a lot, but he didn't run for 40 days. He just, he just running. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to get out. I got to get. Boom, hits the ground, passes out. Angel comes up to him. It says, come on, man. What are you so afraid of? Here, here's something to eat. He gets up and runs a little bit. Boom, falls down again. The angel's loving him. Come on, man. You don't need to be afraid. Get back into, get back into the game. Get back into the race. Come on. We just, we just had this major. It doesn't say exactly what was said, but this is what's going on. Feeds him some kind of awesomeness, and he runs for 40 days on one meal. I like to eat too much. I couldn't. And he ends up running into a cave all by himself, running from one mean little old lady. I'm thinking, what kind of missed opportunity was this? All these people saw this miracle. Ahab saw this miracle. His reign is about to come. And one mean old lady messes it up for everybody. He's in this cave. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, here it is. He came to the cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, What are you doing? I got to saying this to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. The sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And God said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking it into pieces. And look, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah, when he hears it, he wraps his face in his mantle. He's standing at the entrance of the cave. And behold, the voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I'm going to say this. Two things. God always knows the answer to the question that he asks you. Remember? Adam... Where are you? What are you doing here, Elijah? He knew. He knew why I was there. Second point. If God asks you a question that he already knows the answer to, and he asks you the same exact question twice, you might ought to reconsider your answer. What are you doing here, Elijah? He answers it the same way. I've been very zealous for you, Lord, the God of hosts. The sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Look at that. Have forsaken your covenant. And he said, they've torn down your altars, killed your prophets, with the sword and I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go, look, watch this, watch this. He said, go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you've arrived, you shall anoint Haziel king over Aram and Jehu the son of Nimshi you shall anoint as king over Israel. And watch this, and anoint Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about that the one who escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu, shall put him to death. The one who escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. And then he brings some clarity to his errant thinking. He said, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. There's a whole lot more making it than he thought, right? 
So he departed and went and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. And while he was, watch this, and while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, he with the 12th, and he with the 12th. Listen, you may miss this. I don't want you to miss this. Elisha is not some wimpy little small guy that has a prophetic gift. No, 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 no. Elisha is a man's man. He is a hoss. He is probably a, 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 a nose tackle size guy, maybe, maybe a blind side offensive lineman, big, big old guy. How do I, why do I say that? It's not even fair to say that. Listen, it says he has 12 pairs of oxen and he is with the 12th, meaning one of the oxen got sick. And so to make up the difference so the one doesn't have to pull, he yokes up with that 12th oxen and he's pulling. He, anybody ever see an axle oxen pull? I mean, they are pulling. They are pulling through the field. He's pulling with that oxen. But if you do that once or twice and survive, you're going to know you built some muscles that you didn't know existed. And so that's who he's dealing with. And there he is. He's plowing with the twelfth, and Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. Just threw it on Elisha. And he left him, uh, left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, he said, sir, please let me kiss my father. Let me kiss my mother and I will follow you. I believe he grabbed his mantle back from Elisha. And he said, go back, go back. What have I have to do with you? Elijah did not want a replacement. He did not want a replacement. He just had the biggest miracle that had existed known to mankind. And made one mistake by running away and an angel fed him so you know that there's definitely some pull, pull for him to get it right. And the first word out of the Lord after answering the same question twice, the wrong way, the Lord said, listen, anoint that king, anoint that leader, and you don't want to get it done. I got somebody else that will go anoint Elisha the prophet that's going to take your place. And he didn't like it. And the way he treated him can only be described with one word, indifference. Follow me if you want to. Don't follow me if you don't want to. I want you to know there's a big difference between indifference and nurturing. You can pour, you can anoint, you can train, but it's not the same thing as nurturing. Nearly every one of the same miracles Elijah did, Elisha did, but the nurturing was missing. The pouring, the training, the anointing continued, but the nurturing never, ever came. We see this. The latter part of the days of Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. It came about when the Lord was about to take Elijah up and the world went into heaven. I described that a little while ago. Then Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take your master from over you today? He said, Yes, I know. Be still. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know? That the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said again, yes, I know. Be still. Some people see the transition better than you do sometimes. They see it coming before you see it coming. You're wrapped up in it. But in the midst of chaos, in the midst of drama, in the midst of all the intensity and complexities of, of transition, whether it's your business, whether it's the hierarchy, the ma matriarch or the patriarch in your family, things are changing. Seasons come, seasons go. What you have to understand is there comes a time, regardless of who's screaming the loudest, where you say, yes, I know, be still. 
And Elijah said, please stay here, as, as, as for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. He said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite at a distance. And the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and folded it and struck the waters that divided here from there. And the two of them walked across on dry ground to the other side. Oh, he didn't say, somebody get with me in a 40-day campaign because we need to pray that this water departs. No, he just touched it. And those things. 50 prophets were sitting there going, shut up. They walk across on dry ground. And when they crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what shall I do before I'm taken from you? Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit upon me, be upon me. And here it is. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, I think it's a word we should never use. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it'll be done. But if not, no. No. That's not what nurturing looks like. You know what nurturing says? Elisha says, if I just want this one thing, I just want a double portion of what the Lord has given you to be upon me. Nurturing says, oh, you're going to see it. I'm going to make sure you see it. I'm going to give you everything I got. My last breath, I'm giving it to you. My next word, my last word of encouragement, I'm giving it to you. I'm going to make sure what, if it's within my power and my ability to make sure that you get a double portion, I will give it to you. But not Elijah. Hey, if you're there, good. If not, well, tough darts. And as they were going along, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses which separated the two of them. We don't always know when the transition's coming, do we? And, and Elijah went up into the world, went into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, I said, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And he says, then he saw Elijah no more. And the word says that the mantle, <laughs> I'm not going to do it any justice, it flutters down out of heaven, he catches it. He says something that let me know he was not poured in properly. He stands there, 50 prophets are still there, remember? They're still on the bank watching. He stoops down on the edge of the Jordan, and he says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And the waters parted, and he walked across on dry ground. When we nurture correctly, those that we nurture don't say that. They don't say, where's the Lord God of Richard? You know what they say? Where's my God? Where's my God? Because the relationship is not between me and them and then God. No, 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 no. Not between you and them and then God. No, it's between them and God. We're not God. We're not a substitute for God. we got to get it to where nurturing means they have their own experience. They have their own anointing. They have their own flow. They have their own conviction. They have their own connection. We get to play a part, but they have their own journey. Somebody give God praise. I'm almost done. And he said, I want a double portion of what the Lord has given me. I want what the Lord has given you. And we know this. Elisha got a double portion of blessing, miracles, anointing, strong prophetic flow. But he also got a double portion of indifference, of no nurturing. He did. His heart lacked the ability to nurture and bring some along. We see this in this very same chapter. The next thing you see, here it is, Elisha, the one that God said to pick. 
He's walking from the Jordan. He does a small miracle about fixing the water so the land will actually be productive. We, we can talk about that some other time. The next thing, he's just walking. He's just going on about his normal day, and all of a sudden these 42, 42 bad little kids jump out of the bushes, and they start making fun of Elijah, Elisha because he's bald. I mean, some people think being bald is cool. Some people don't think being bald is cool. I mean, it really bothered Elisha that he was bald, obviously, because when the 42 kids jump out, they're going, oh, look at your bald head, your bald head thing, your well, look at cue ball, man, look at your bald, you're so bald. Hey, who is that? Oh, that's Mr. Baldy. Look at that. Look at that. He made him so mad. Remember, there is no nurturing. There's no caring. There's, there's this self-absorbed indifference, not wanting to pour into the next generation. You know what Elisha does? He, he, all of a sudden, he puts a curse on them. And these two mama bear come out of the bushes and kills all 42 of those kids. I'm like, man, I think I would have handled it differently. It's like, hey, kids, let me give you a little lesson on honor, right? Come on. Who's, I know your mama and daddy I'm taking. We're going to tell, tell what y'all just did. Y'all made fun of me. I, 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 Clay, listen, I, I need to get over whatever I need to get over, but y'all don't need to treat. You need to treat your elders with respect. That's what should have happened, Right? But that's not what happened. In chapter 3, three chapters later, Elisha has a servant. His name is Gehazi. Naaman was healed of leprosy. And Naaman wanted to go give something to, to Elisha. And he said, no, 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 I don't want anything. Gehazi is like a greedy kind of, uh, maybe he's, um, I don't know, he's, he's pilfering or stealing. or I don't know what he's doing. Anyway, he's got character issues. And so he catches up with Naaman and says, hey, listen, I know my boss said didn't really need anything, but you know what, I could really, we, could, we could really use. And so prophetically, he knew what uh, Gehazi had done. Confronts him, he lies. And so Naaman, who was healed of leprosy, Elisha pronounces that same curse of leprosy on Gehazi. And he said not only on him would he have leprosy for the rest of his life, his whole family would suffer with that leprosy forever. You can't tell me when you don't pour right, there's not eternal consequences. We need to make sure that those that follow us don't repeat the nonsense stuff that we've done in the past. We need to teach people how to love, how to forgive, how to run better than we ever did. I'm, I already said it. Let me say it again. I know I went over, but hey, we, we celebrated Greg. Watch, I'm almost done. Watch this. But the next thing we see is something very strange with regarding the death of Elisha that we know what I'm saying is true. At the death of Elisha, it's actually in 2 Kings 13, 20, Elisha dies and they bury him. And there's a band of Moabites that invade the land in the spring of the year, every year. And as they're burying this man, because they were in such a hurry to bury Elisha, the grave is open. It's just an open grave. And so there's this marauding band, this, this enemy force that's coming in the area. They take this dead guy and they throw him on top of the dead open grave, the body of Elisha. And as soon as this man who's dead lands on top of Elisha, the Bible says that the man is touched by the bones of Elisha. He's revived and he stands on his feet. I mean, he's dead. And all of a sudden, he crawls up out of there like something off of a thriller video. He's like, hey, I'm alive. And so I go and, I, and I'm fascinated with the story of Elijah and Elisha, the anointing, the power, the miracles, and even this final glimpse. I thought, wow, his, even his dead bones were anointed that this man who's dead gets thrown on top. How, how can it be? I was in prayer. I said, God, how can this be? And the Lord spoke to me, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. It's not supposed to be like that. It had so much power that his dead bones revives him. It's not, he said, it's not supposed to be like that. That which, here it is, that which he had in him died with him and that's not how it's supposed to be it's supposed to be that we make these deposits in other people 
that God has called us to. The baton is supposed to be passed. The next runner needs to be nurtured, trained, instructed, but most importantly, nurtured. And our job is supposed to be that which we make sure that those that run after us far surpass us. Here it is. Don't let what God gave you die with you. Will you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you real quick. Yeah, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to stir in the caverns of our heart and our mind people that are in our season. Students, some of you are teachers. I just have a feeling that God's going to begin to connect you with young people or even other new, new teachers that you pour into, some, into them some good God things that will live long after you've gone on to do something else. Some of you guys in business, you're going to have, uh, maybe it's a, an apprentice that comes along after you. I'll tell you what breaks my heart is to see farms sold that were thriving 50 years ago because there wasn't a son or a daughter or a, even an employee that wanted to take the reins of that and make it something. Generations before, they gave everything to make that farm work with a big old for sale sign on it. It's not just farming. It's other businesses. It's other activities. Churches. Do you know how many hundreds of churches every year close? Because there's not somebody to pass the baton to. Or there's not a leader that, in, that, that had the right posture of his heart to say, Hey, this is not just how to do it, but this is why we do it. And this is the heart in which we do it in. What, let me just say it. What you do matters. What God gave you matters. And giving it to others Giving to others what God gave you matters. Take your hands and turn them like this. We're not going to leave anybody. Listen, none of it matters if, if we don't let God be in control. So let me catch you up real quick. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I confess I've made mistakes. I've sinned. I didn't nurture the best I could. Open up my eyes, Lord. Show me. Lead me into those that I can pour into. And if someone's pouring into me, help me to be a gracious recipient and never forget that someone poured. So Lord Jesus, I receive you as Savior and Lord, author and finisher of my faith for all eternity. Help me to lead more like you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. God bless you.